Okay, shalom everyone, praise the Lord. Jai Masiki. And uh, welcome to class, everyone. Uh, we are um, going to begin now. We'll uh, continue from uh, where we stopped last week. Last week, uh, we were looking, we looked at the first of the nine guideposts that helps us to know God's will. So the first guidepost is what? Do you all remember? What is the first guidepost? Recognize the general teaching and instruction of God's word. Okay, so we'll um, we'll just do a brief, quick recap, and then we would um, uh, begin with uh, the second guidepost. So, can one of you please unmute your mics or take the mic and please uh, lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Quickly, anyone can lead us in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We want to bless your name for gathering us once together. We pray that you keep our hearts open to what you have for us today. We pray for Pastor Selena as she takes us through. May you anoint her. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Oh, I thought I can present it. No need. I thought I can present it. Yeah. But how will the uh, in-person students see the PowerPoints? Oh, okay, 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 thank you. So they're just trying to figure out how the PowerPoint presentation, I have a PowerPoint presentation just to do a recap of what we had uh, looked at last week. So we'll just wait. They're trying to figure it out. Uh, and then we will see if we can use it. Others will just, I'll just explain. It's not coming on. Is it coming or no? Okay. Okay, so since it's, uh, I don't know, they're figuring it out for the online students. I don't know if you can see the PowerPoint presentation, but we'll just uh, quickly do a recap of what we studied last week. Last week, uh, we looked, looked at Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, in-person students. The slideshow is on the screen, so you can see it. So we, uh, we looked at for Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 and 11, where it says, Paul says, you that, that he assures us that we can be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Okay, so just like he prayed for the church at Colossae, we also can pray for ourselves. We said that we can be filled with the knowledge of his will. Okay, so to be filled with the knowledge of his will, what do you need? You need wisdom and spiritual understanding. You need spiritual and spiritual understanding and wisdom to be filled with the knowledge of his will. Okay, so which means it takes wisdom. And it takes spiritual understanding to know the will of God. Then we also said that when we are filled with the knowledge of his will, what happens? We walk worthy of the Lord in a way that is going to honor God. Uh, we will be well pleasing to him. We will be fruitful in every good work. And we will keep increasing in the knowledge of God. Okay. So it's like a, it's like a cycle. Okay, so you're filled with the knowledge of his will, then you walk worthy of the Lord, you do things that are well pleasing to him, you're fruitful in every good work, and then you keep 
increasing again in the knowledge of his will. So it's like a cycle. It's like a full cycle that keeps going on. And then we said that, you know, um, uh, we will look at these uh, nine guideposts. And we began with the first one. The first one was to recognize the general teaching and instruction of God's word. And we looked at Romans chapter 12 verse 2, where we said that we need to prove what is the good, acceptable and the perfect will of God. Okay. So to prove what is the good, acceptable and the perfect will of God, what do we need? We need a renewed mind. And what is a renewed mind? A renewed mind is able to take on the higher, sorry, it's not rays, it's ways. Okay, it's a W and not R, sorry. We're able to take on the higher ways and the thoughts of God. Okay, because Isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 to 11, God says, My ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your ways. Thoughts, okay, and then we looked at Hebrews chapter 4, 5, verse 14, which says that those who are mature, uh, that is, those who by constant use of the word or the you know the solid word of God, they have their senses trained to discern what is both good and evil. So, are you projecting it from this slide, Ravine, or you've did you show the previous slides as well? Okay. So what does Hebrews chapter 5 say? It says that those who, who are those people who are mature, a mature person is one who is constantly using the word of God. And by using the solid word of God, they have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil okay so when we are constantly using the word of god what happens what happens when we are constantly using the word of god we are able to discern the good pleasing perfect and acceptable will of god okay so when are you using the the word of god constantly is when you are being in the word if you look at the slide it says when you're being in the word when you're speaking the word, you are meditating the word, and you're applying and you're living by the word. Okay. So when you are doing this, you grow from being a babe to being a fully mature person. And a fully mature person has their senses trained. You know what is your senses, right? We have five senses. You know, we mentioned that last week. So our senses are trained to understand and discern what is the good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. Okay, so that is a quick uh, recap of what we um, did um, last week. So we'll move on. Um, now we're going to look at the second guidepost, which is on page number, uh, so, uh, um, sorry. Yeah, we look at the second guidepost, which is on page number 13. Okay, so I said last week that we will be looking at how many guideposts? Nine, okay. And what do these guideposts help us? It helps us to discern and to know God's plan and purpose for our lives. So I said that even as we go through these nine guideposts, I want you to think about your own life. You may say, hey, this is where I connect or, you know, this is what I see in my life and so as we go through this i want you to spend some time to analyze to think to examine so that you by the end of this course are able to understand and discern and know what is god's plan for you in this season of your life and in the next season of your life so please don't think this course as a course where you know you have to just enroll to get a certificate or you have to just sit through these lectures you know uh, just to so that you are eligible to get your course certificate no let let us look at it in a way that hey i'm going through this course by the end of this course i want to be able to discern and know what is god's good pleasing perfect will for my life amen 
Okay, so that is what we are going to do. And uh, we, we looked at the first guidepost is to recognize the general teaching and instruction in God's word. And we said that God never leads us contrary to his word. Or he will never ask us to do anything that contradicts his word. So if you want to do something, you go back to the Bible. And if you see that it's not in the Bible, that means you know that it is not from God. It's your own thoughts, your emotions, or it's just people telling you to do it. Okay. The second uh, guidepost is to recognize the seeds in your life. This is a very important principle. Okay. Now, what is the meaning of seeds? All of you have seen seeds. Yes. So when you take seeds in your hand, what are the thoughts that come to your mind when you look at the seeds? Fruit, plant, what else? What comes to your mind when you look at seeds? Come on. Huh? It helps, okay? It helps multiplying, okay? But in your hand, it looks very dead. There is no plant, there is no fruit, there is no uh, flower, right? It looks very dead, it looks dormant. It uh, does not have any, it does not, it shows a promise, but it's not, you know, is we're not very promising, so to say. But when you put that same seed in the ground, okay, you till the ground, you put the seed, you put water, you put manure, what happens? It germinates, you know, uh, it, um, you water it, the plants begins to grow, and then it grows into a big tree, and it starts giving fruits or flower, or whatever the seed is supposed to do or to bear, it does that, right? The same way, God initiates things in our life like the seed principle, okay? So when God gives you something in your life or he is asking you to do something in your life, sometimes it can be very small, it can be very insignificant, uh, it can be almost lifeless, but that little thing, you know, has the potential to initiate a full life it's full of potential, it's full of promise, and if you just recognize it, if you nurture that, if you build on it, it will grow into something that can enhance, build, and extend the kingdom of God. So that little seed, that little thing that God is giving to you can seem lifeless, can seem not very promising, uh, not very beneficial, not full of potential, but when you take that seed which has the promise of God, that has the life of God, that has the full potential of God to grow into something big, you know, it will extend, help extending the kingdom of God and it will also be a blessing to many. Okay, so we look at, uh, 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 there are many examples of seed in the Bible. The seed can be referred to as the kingdom of God. The seed can be referred to as money. The seed is also referred to as life. We don't have time to go into all of those aspects, but we'll just look at the seed concerning how we can discern what is God's plan and purpose for our life. So if you look at Mark chapter 4 verses 26 to 32, can somebody read that please? Mark chapter 4 verses 26 to 32. It's not here, I'll tell you. Mark 6, 4, Mark 4, sorry, 26 to 32. Who has a mic? And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise and by day. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man would scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the, earthly, uh, for the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts the sickle because the harvest has come. Then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It's like a mustard seed, which when it's sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. But when it's sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. So here Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God and he's using a parable to tell us how the kingdom of God is. So he says the kingdom of God is like a 
seed. Okay. Now, um, when the mighty work of God is to be released on the earth, God releases it like a, the seed principle, something that is very small, something in a very insigni insigni insignificant way, but like a little seed in somebody's life okay and it comes like very quiet it's almost insignificant almost lifeless but that seed that calling of god or what god wants us to do carries within it potential uh, to make a tremendous difference okay and if the seed is nurtured if what god gives you, you know his plan and purpose for your life what god gives you you know, is nurtured, then a mighty work of God's kingdom is released on the earth. And that work blesses the hearts of people and blesses the lives of many people. Okay. So the kingdom of God operates out of this seed principle and we need to understand it. Okay, that when God gives something to us, asks us to do something, it's very small, it's very significant. But when we take it, nurture it, use it, you know, it grows into something significant and something great for the kingdom of God. Okay, so also in our lives, okay, the same way God works in our lives, He releases seeds in our lives, and uh, these seeds are kingdom seeds. These seeds are seeds of spiritual destiny, okay? That when we use these seeds, it can grow into something big for his kingdom. So don't say, God, you know, you've given me something small, something so insignificant. You've called me to do something small. I thought you were going to call me to do something great and big. It can seem small, but it's going to, God is going to grow it into something big if we are willing to nurture it. Amen? Okay, so what could be the seeds in our life? The seeds could, in our lives could be, you know, opportunities that God gives in our lives, those that he opens in our lives. It could be special contacts. It can be special people who speak prophetic words over our life that shape the course and the destiny of our life, that can move and influence our lives in certain ways. It can also be dreams. You don't have to worry about him. Doesn't matter if he's sleeping, you can just concentrate. Okay. So you can just con, you can, you know, uh, it can be dreams. It can be things that, you know, uh, God uh, brings into your lives, people he brings into your lives that he shapes your divine destiny. Okay. So it can also be a prophetic word that God speaks uh, and gets somebody to speak in your life in a very early stage. And these things that people have spoken into your life can alter the course of your life, can change the course and the destiny of your life. So these are the seeds in your life. We look at some examples in the Bible that will help us uh, understand what is the seed uh, or what is the seed principle. For example, take Joseph. What do you think was the seed in Joseph's life? His dreams, yes. So when he was a young boy, he had this dream where the sun and the moon, the 11 stars were bowing down to him. That is his brothers and his father and his mother. And then he had this dream where all the 11 sheaves of uh, grain were bowing down to uh, him. Okay. So what was the dream all about? God was just telling him that he's going to raise him into a position that is much higher than his brother's than his father and his mother. And God was telling him through this dream, it through in a very early stage of his life, that he's going to take him to a place of great influence and prominence, to a place where, you know, even his own people will come and bow down before him. Did that dream and that promise come true? Yes. So what was a seed in Joseph's life? It was his dreams. Now let's look at Moses' life. What do you think was a seed in Moses' life? What was a seed in Moses' life? Two things. One, he was Sorry. taught by the... You can just say it even if it's wrong, doesn't matter. Mama, two things. What is a seed one, in Moses' life? Two things. Supernatural? One, supernatural. God's word. Okay. Yes. We can't hear the online students. 
ma'am uh, uh, two things one is uh, see, see raj is trying to speak and we can't hear the online students yeah can you just tell him we can't hear the online students sri raj is trying to speak but we can't hear him okay so we look at what is a seed in moses's life okay now we see that you know god supernaturally arranged for moses to be raised in pharaoh's house okay because he was adopted by pharaoh's daughter okay and we read this in um, um uh, in acts chapter 7 that's on the powerpoint can you just show that please god uh, god got moses into pharaoh's palace okay and where he was trained to be the next leader of egypt so if you look at acts chapter 7 uh, let me present that for the uh students here okay acts chapter 7 verses 22 to 25 can somebody read that please it's on the screen as well acts 7 22 to 25 Who's reading? And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now, when he was forty years old, it came into his heart to visit. And Moses his brethren, was the learned in Israel, all the wisdom of the and was home. mighty in words and deeds. Now, when he was forty years old, he came into his heart to visit his brethren and the children of Israel. And seeing one of them su suffer wrong. he defeated and he avenged, defended he defended and avenged him who who was oppressed and struck down the egyptian for he supposed that his brethren who have understood that god would deliver them by his hand but they did not understand yes but they did not understand right so here we see that you know moses uh um, you know in we read in acts chapter 7 that god raised him up for a purpose and what was that purpose to become a leader okay so that is why he took him to pharaoh's palace and he was trained in the wisdom of the egyptians he was trained to be the next pharaoh but moses he he knew in his heart that you know why god took him away from his parents brought him to this palace because he knew that he wanted to uh, raise him up to be the leader okay and so that is what he says here uh, he says that you know um when he was 40 years old it came in his heart that means he knew in his heart that hey god is raising me up to deliver my people but he and he supposed that his brethren look at verse 25 of acts chapter 7 he supposed that his brethren would have understood that god would deliver them by his hand but they did not understand okay so what is a seed in david's in moses's life uh to be a leader okay so that is what he recognized look at uh, david's life okay um uh david when he was a Uh, still a young boy it was through the prophetic anointing that samuel anointed him as the next king of israel so how did david recognize his calling as the next king it was through the prophet so i said you know the seeds come come to prophetic word but it came to him when he was very very young and we see that as a young boy you know he earned a reputation among the people okay so we'll uh, look at that in first samuel uh it's up on your screen first samuel chapter 16 verse 18 look at what reputation th that uh, david had among his people can somebody read that please the one of the servants answered and said look i have seen a son of jesse the Be uh, the bethel bethlehemite who is skillful in playing a mighty man of valor a man of war prudent in speech and handsome person and the lord is with him so what did what is a kind of uh, uh, you know um, you know uh, what do you say what's the word um, how did people see him or the kind of uh, testimony that he had 
uh, before the people. So here, people saw David as one who is the son of Jesse, but he was very, very skillful in playing. And that is why we know these are all his seeds, skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor. That means a mighty uh, soldier, somebody who is very strong, uh, you know, in fighting battles, a man of war, prudent in speech, that means good in speech, and a very handsome person, okay? So all these were the seeds in, uh, in, um, in um, uh, David's life, which people recognized they saw and was a kind of a testimony to who he um, was. And this is even before David started serving King Saul, it was even before David fought Goliath that you know, people had this high, uh, uh, you know, they, the way they looked at him was in such a high way, okay? So, um, and we know that because he was very skillful in playing, in music, we know later on that David goes on to write all of these psalms. We also see that he had a reputation of being a man of valor, very bold, courageous, a man of war. That was his seed. And that is why we also see that he was able to fight many battles, also fight Goliath. So he earned this reputation. And we see that these were the seeds in his life. All of you able to understand? Yes, no? Okay. We look at. We look at a last example, Esther. Okay, what do you think is a seed in Esther's life? Huh? Fearing Esther? God. Yeah, I know the online students can't be heard, but they're trying to fix it. I don't know if it's work. Is it? Will the online students be able to hear now? When they speak, can we hear them? Yes, no? Yes? Okay. Online Hello. student, anyone Hello. wants to speak? Hello. No, we can't hear them still. Uh, Juliana is speaking, but we can't hear. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Sri Raj. Thank you, Elkana. Uh, the seed in Esther's life was her beauty, right? God used her beauty, even though it was something that is very, very worldly, but God used that, you know, to make her the queen. Even though she was a Jew, she married a Gentile king. But we know that, you know, why did she go into that place? Because her uncle Mordecai says that, hey, Esther, God brought you into this position. Okay. You're brought into this kingdom in such a time as this. And so he's telling her that you are in the right place at the right time for a divine purpose. And so he's saying, realize it and recognize it. Okay, and do something about it. So he's saying, hey, you are beautiful. Now you become the queen. Now it's time for you to save your people. Okay, go before the king's presence and plead on him on behalf of the people. Okay, so we see that, you know, they fast and pray for how many days? Three days. And then when she goes, she goes without getting permission in the king's presence. And the king is so enthralled by her beauty that he just, you know, stretches out his scepter. And then he says, ask me anything you wish, even half my kingdom, and I will give it to her. Okay. Of course, it's a favor of God, but also God uses her beauty, something that is natural, but something that we consider as worldly, but God used that as a seed. So if you want to know what is God's plan and purpose for your life, look at the seeds in your life. I'll give you an example of my own life for you to uh, help understand. Now, when I was a kid, I used to love children. Okay, so whenever any child in our church is lost, they'll always say, you know, find Selena and you'll find the children, the child. Okay. And I also remember that, and I never knew that I'm going to land up in full time ministry and that was children's ministry. Okay. But I basically love children. So that is kind of a seed in my life. Another seed in my life was that, you know, during summer holidays, we all used to attend vacation Bible school. Have all of you attended vacation Bible school or summer camp, summer Bible schools, they call it. 
Okay, so I used to attend that, but I was also very interested to hold the same thing in my house for my two sisters. I have an older sister and two younger sisters. The third one, the fourth one was not yet born. So the first and third were there. And I was very interested to hold summer vacation Bible classes for my two sisters at home. So I'll find a place in our home, a room in our house, I'll set it up. I, I used to love these flannel pictures. I don't know if you know what flannel pictures is. They have something called a flannel board where you cut pictures in the Bible stories and you just, and you're narrating it. You just put it, it just sticks on that, you know, cloth. I was very excited. I used to tell my mom, ask my mother how to go about doing this. And I used to go to the pastor and I used to think about a topic and I used to ask the pastor to help me to give all the ref scripture references and what to do. I did not realize that that will become my full time vocation that I will be doing children's ministry. I'll be doing summer schools. I'll be doing kids conference or VBS in the summer and ministering to children. So these were the seeds in my life and i didn't recognize that these are seeds but these seeds are actually now when i look back i look at as them as seeds and these were something that god put in my life and that he's using it now so if you want to know what is god's plan and purpose for your life look at the seeds in your life are you able to understand what i'm saying yes yes or no yes, yes. so these seeds are basically conveying a message concerning god's plan and purpose and direction for our life. So say, take some time to just look at your own life, look at the seeds, recognize some prophetic words, some things people have spoken, opportunities that God is opening for you, those that he's opening for you. So just look at it because these seeds are indicative of God's plan and purpose for your life. Now, I just also want to give you a warning. This is not there in your notes. just want to give you a warning. Just like God sows kingdom seeds, the Satan also sows, sows weeds in our life. You know what are weeds, right? Yes, the weeds are just pulled out and passed away and they are burnt. Okay. Now, these weeds that Satan sows can actually hinder, stop or choke God's plan and purposes to come into fruition in our lives. So what are some of these weeds in our lives? It can be the action of our parents. You know, your parents have already always spoken negative about, about you. They said you're useless or your, or your teachers, they've spoken uh, negative things about you. You're useless, you're hopeless, you will amount to nothing, you will come to nothing, you'll become a failure. Or some of, sometimes the, the weeds can be the divorce that our parents are, have gone through. Or our parents are not divorced, but they are separated. Those can be weeds that choke God's plan and purpose for our lives. Weeds can also be physical abuse that you have gone through. You know, when you were young, your, um, your, your parents would have beaten you up, punished you severely. You know, uh, physical abuse, some of you sexual abuse. So all of these can be things that have made a dent in your emotions, okay, your emotional being. And Satan can use these weeds to destroy the kingdom seeds. So what do we do? You know, you need to be, you need to know what are those weeds what are those things that you are harboring that is holding you back? You, you, you need to uh, speak over it. You need to denounce it. You need to ask God to heal you. And, you know, so that that will not be a hindrance for the work of God in your life. Okay? Able to understand? Yes? Okay? So we see that our class lectures is not just hearing. There's a lot of work that you have to do for yourself. We'll move to the third guidepost. What is the third guidepost? You can put the previous slide which shows the guideposts. Um, what is the, th the third one? You have to move back. Yeah. Yeah, move back, please. Yeah. So the next one is recognize the stirring in your hearts. Now, sometimes how do we discern God's plan and purpose for our lives? God stirs our hearts up to do something. So we can discern what God is calling us to do by a stirring in our 
heart. We look at an example in ne through Nehemiah's life. So can somebody please read Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. It's in the publication, page number 15. Can somebody read that, please? The words of Nehemiah, the son of Elijah. It no, Hekalia. Hekalia. Uh, it came to pass in the month of Chislev. Chiswil in the 20, 20th, 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the Kitab, Kitadil, Citadel. Citadel, that Hanan, Hanani, one of my Berithin, Bethren, came with men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in, in great distress and re, re reproach. reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the gods of heaven. Before the God of heaven. Yes. Can somebody else read Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 12, please? Someone else? Is there in your textbook? Quickly. Then, then I arose in the night. I and few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one which I rode. Thank you. So here we see in this context that, you know, the, the people of um, uh, Judah, they were, um, uh, you know, taken away by the Babylonians, okay? Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem, burnt up the temple, destroyed the temple, burnt up the, you know, city and the entire walls and took everyone as captive to Babylon. Okay. And then we see that uh, Babylon was overthrown by the Persian king and God let Cyrus uh, stir his heart up to send back the Jews back to Jerusalem. Okay. So here we see that Nehemiah, what was his job? He's a cupbearer to the king okay so when one of the brothers called hanani had come from jerusalem nehemiah inquires of him how the city is doing so what does hanani say the city walls are city walls are broken down the city walls are destroyed okay so if you were in that time just imagine you were there in that period of time okay and, you know, those who came back from Jerusalem, you're a Jew, you belong to Jerusalem, you're still living in Babylon. And they came and say, hey, the city walls are broken down. What would be your reaction? Huh? Sad, okay. What would be your reaction? Come on, man. A simple question. Sad, okay. What else? Huh? Crying? What would be your reaction? Fear, stressful. Some of us will think, hey, it's just a wall. It's broken down long time back. <laughs> you know, it'll be built one fine day. It's okay. Let's continue with our life. Won't bother about it. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. But look at what Nehemiah, what happens to Nehemiah? What does he do? What does Nehemiah do? He sat down and wept. He's mourning and he's fasting. You'll be thinking, why should somebody mourn and fast for city walls that are broken down? Okay. But look at what it says, what he says in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 12, when Nehemiah gets permission, the king looks at him and says, Hey, Nehemiah, what, what's happening to you? Why are you looking so down? You know, what is bothering you? Then he tells his burden. The king sends him to Jerusalem, gives him permission, security, gives him all the things that is needed to build the temple, uh, sorry, the walls of Jerusalem. So when he goes to Jerusalem, he, he takes, uh, you know, he goes in the night to survey the whole thing, okay? And he tells no one, he tells them what God had put in his heart to do at Jerusalem, okay? But we see that there was a stirring in his heart. The, so many people heard about 
the fallen, broken down walls of Jerusalem. But everyone thought, okay, it's broken down a long time back. It will someday we'll go back and build. Let's continue with our lives. But for Nehemiah, it was not that. There was a deep stirring. He was crying, he was weeping, he was mourning actually. He was so burdened. Why? Because it was God stirring up his heart to do something about it. Are you able to understand? Yes? Okay. So God was stirring his heart to do something about it. So sometimes God will stir up our hearts to do something that he wants us to do for his kingdom. Okay. So sometimes, you know, it can be a simple stirring in our heart, but that stirring will not stop, you know, till we are, you know, we have taken hold of it. You know, it's like night and day. We have, when we sleep, we are thinking about it. Our heart is stirred towards it. When we wake up, it's, you know, our heart is thinking about it. You know, when you are walking, you are running, you are working, you are even in a meeting, you are listening in, a, in your, uh, you know, in your, um, uh, in a job place, in your workplace, in your meeting, or you're doing your work on the computer. If you're a computer professional or if you're a teacher, you're teaching, suddenly your heart is stirred up about this thing that God is stirring your heart to do something. Okay, so it's that kind of stirring that, you know, is with you when you sleep, when you wake up, you know, um, and every part of you is saying, hey, do something about it. Why? Because it's not something that is coming from you. It is God who's stirring up your heart. Okay, but we should not uh, connect this to emotional stirring. For example, if I invite Pastor Nancy, invite somebody to give you a talk and they come here and talk about you know, uh, Otto Raja's ministry. We have somebody called Otto Raja here. He, is, he drives an auto. He found destitute people on the streets. He brings them to his home, people who are sick, people who are, you know, having open wounds, festering wounds, people who have no one to care for them, people in a dying stage. He, he takes them, puts them in the auto. He'll bring them to his home and so you know he's set up a home for that and that was God stirring his heart to do something about it now I'm sure all of us travel on the road we have seen so many people like this I have seen so many people like this but my heart is not stirred up to do anything for them I just feel sad you know I sometimes I just feel so sad and I sometimes I count my blessings then think I should not grumble that's that's about it okay but if suppose somebody comes and they show you you know, Otto Raja is showing you all the pictures. Your heart is so stirred up. Some of you are crying. Some of you, your eyes are watering. Your high, you know, heart is so burdened. Or someone here is coming and talking about children who are sex trafficked, okay? Or women who are sex trafficked. They're showing you all the pictures and how these women are so innocent. These children are so innocent. And your heart is stirred up. Okay, and you're very emotional, you're crying about it, or you're so burdened, you're so sad. Maybe you don't eat lunch that day, okay? Or you don't go out and play, or you don't talk to anybody. But that slowly fades away. You don't think about it. That is an emotional stirring. But if you see that, and you know your heart is constantly stirred up, whether you're sleeping, you're praying, you go back to your workplace, or maybe you're studying, or, you know, maybe you're, um, uh, you know, praying, or when you are you know, playing in the, in, your, in the Bible college or in the supernatural hour or you're sitting in the classroom listening to the lecture but God is stirring up your heart. Hey, I want you to do something. That means God is saying, I have a plan and a purpose for you. I want you to rise up to do something for children who are sex trafficked. Or I want you to do something for women who are sex trafficked. Or I want you to do something about destitute people. Right. I'm just giving you examples. So there can be such a stirring in our heart. I'll give you an example from my own life. Now, I never knew that I would be in children's ministry. I always wanted to do counseling. So I was counseling drug addicts and alcoholics. But God always opened the doors of opportunities for me to minister among children. And those were the seeds. So when I went to Bible college, I think I already said this, right? When I went to Bible college, God opened for me uh, doors to minister in school, in the campus where we minister to children, even the weekend ministry, the church, I was connected with Sunday school. But even when I finished Bible college, I wanted to go back and start a women's addiction center for women because we did not have anything in Kolkata. 
but God brought me back to Bangalore City and I find myself doing children's ministry. So I saw God opening doors of opportunities anywhere and everywhere I went for children's ministry. So that was the seed in my life. And I told you that I was in, uh, in um, uh, an organization. I worked there for five years. It was a family ministry. And in that family ministry, I was the first year I was just doing basic office related work, keeping accounts and, you know, organizing all their programs and all that. And I learned quite a bit, you know, God uses all of that to train us. But the end of that one year, I remember my boss telling me, hey, you're very good with children. Why don't you start a project for children? So we, along with another person, we started a project uh, for teens in schools where we were teaching them life skills uh, through the the, the word of God. We wrote a curriculum. We started it in schools in Bangalore and also across different states in India. But the end of that five years, you know, my boss said, I wanted to go to Mumbai and start this project. But I didn't feel a leading in my heart to go. I didn't sense a leading. My parents said no. And I thought this time I need to obey my parents because I disobeyed my parents and went to Bible college. But this time I thought, let me obey my parents. And I didn't feel that in my heart to go. So I said, I'm not going, I can't go. So he was he was very disappointed. He said, you are our first staff. And so if you set this trend, it'll be very difficult for others. They say, she didn't go. You can't expect us to go either. So you have to leave the organization. And that really broke my heart because that project which I started was my baby. It was something that I loved, something that I enjoyed doing. It was my heart, soul, mind that I was just pouring out into that project. So I said, OK, because I just sense the peace of God. I know God has something in store. So that was April. I finished. May was one month. I took rest at home. And in June, when school started, my heart started stirring up within. I said, I was telling God, God, I have to be in schools. And look at me. I'm at home. What, what, what do I do, God? You know, my heart was stirring up to do something for children. And that's when God was telling me, apply in all people's church. So I went to All People's Church, the website. I looked at the website. There was no position for children's ministry. But God is telling me, apply. Okay, sometimes when God tells us to do things can be so foolish, but we just go ahead and obey him. I said, God, there is nothing, no position there which I can apply for. If I apply and they call me for interview, I'll be the first foolish person to tell them I didn't know which post to apply. God told me and I came. But God is saying, apply. So I just applied. And I took a cut a shot. I went for the interview. They called me and I said, God, if they ask me this question, I don't know what to do. And you know what? All the pastors were there. Pastor Ashish never asked me the question, which post did you apply for? You know what he tells me? There's an opening for schools, school ministry. Ryan International School has opened. You all go there every Sundays. You know, will you be willing to do it? And I was so shocked. I just sat it and looked at his face. He said, will you take it up? And I'm too shocked. I couldn't answer him. He said, Sally, now, will you take it up? Yeah, yes, yes, pastor. You know, that is the stirring that I had in my heart. God saying, do something about it in schools. That is how he led me. And that is where I am. That is what I am doing. Okay. So we'll take a break and come back after the break and continue. Thank you.